Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is Patterns of Acute Inflammation. In this short video, I will be comparing and contrasting the different morphologic patterns of acute inflammation. Now, as you already know, perhaps by watching the acute inflammation video, acute inflammation is characterized by dilation of small blood vessels and the accumulation of leukocytes and fluid in the extravascular tissue. However, there are certain gross and microscopic patterns that provide additional information about disease etiology, and that's what I'll be talking about in this video. These are the patterns we'll be examining. Serous inflammation, which is characterized by a cell pore exudate. Fibrinous inflammation, which is due to increased vascular permeability, which allows fibrinogen to leak uh, into the um, extravascular tissue, and then we get subsequent fibrin deposition. Purulent or suppurative inflammation is an exudate of neutrophils, liquefied necrotic cellular debris, and edema fluid, also known as pus. And ulcers are characterized by the sloughing of inflamed or necrotic tissue, leading to local surface defects and excavations. Let's begin with the first, serous inflammation. As I already mentioned, this is a cell pore exudate, and we see it in two general contexts. One is in spaces created by cell injury, such as trauma in a friction blister, toxins, or a viral infection, such as herpes virus. We can also see this in body cavities that are lined by peritoneum, pleura, and pericardium. And an example of this would be a pleural effusion in a case of asbestosis. And depending on which of these sites is involved, the causes differ. So the spaces created by cell injury, that fluid is going to be due to increased vascular permeability, and that fluid comes from the plasma. By contrast, in the body cavities lined by peritoneum, pleura, and pericardium, that fluid is secreted by irritated mesothelial cells. Let's take a look at the histology. Here you can see a low power view of a friction blister. Uh, this is in acral skin. Notice the thickened stratum corneum. And due to mechanical trauma, we've had injury to these cells, which has uh, led to increased vascular permeability. And this, uh, in, in the clinical situation, would be filled with fluid. Let's take a look at a higher magnification of a different area of the same blister. And you can see here this fluid, which characteristically does not have cells in it uh, and is present here in this, uh, right below the uh, stratum corneum. So that would be serous inflammation. And if you look at this fluid uh, grossly, it'll be clear uh, straw colored. Now let's talk about fibrinous inflammation. So, I mentioned that we had increased vascular permeability in serous inflammation, but in fibrinous inflammation, we have a lot more permeability. And this allows larger plasma proteins to exit uh, the vessel, and we can get uh, proteins such as fibrinogen in the extravascular tissue. Now, when that is combined with a local procoagulant stimulus, for example, cancer cells, we will get fibrin deposition. And we typically see fibrinous inflammation when we have inflammation of body cavity linings, such as in the peritoneum, pleura, and pericardium. We will end up with a fibrinous effusion. So an example of this would be fibrinous pericarditis, which we can see due to a variety of causes, including rheumatoid arthritis, acute myocardial infarction, which is called Dressler syndrome, uh, uremia, and trauma. Now, grossly, the uh, appearance is going to be of a shaggy, rough, granular uh, tissue, and that's because of this protein uh, deposition. Now, microscopically, we're going to see this network of uh, mesh of threads, uh, of eosinophilic threads, and the other possibility is it can be just this amorphous coagulum, just a pink blob. Now, something to keep in mind about fibrinous inflammation is that depending on the extent of the fibrin deposition, this may undergo scarring uh, as the body tries to resolve uh, this, uh, this injury. And this can lead, for example, to constrictive pericarditis. And what you see there is that uh, fibrinous pericarditis becomes fibrotic, and the heart can no longer expand fully, and this can cause a decreased cardiac output. So let's look at a gross example uh, here of uh, fibrinous pericarditis. Uh, here you can see the surface uh, of the heart with this meshwork. This just looks like just a, a piece of gauze uh, that's been strung over uh, the pericardium. And then as you, we look here at the histology, uh, you can see here is the pericardium, here is the uh, deposited fibrin, that this is more like a, an amorphous coagulum, and then we have the cardiac myocytes here. 
Now, just to uh, take you back to when we were talking about patterns of necrosis, now you can see why we call it fibro fibronoid necrosis, because that pink uh, material that we see deposited in the vessel wall, uh, for example, in polyarteritis nodosa, has that same uh, quality to what we see here in fibrinous inflammation. Now, purulent or suppurative inflammation, as I've already described, uh, is characterized by pus. And it is most commonly due to infection with pyogenic bacteria. Now, that's a bit of a circular argument because pyogenic means generating pus. So let's make it a little bit more specific and say we see it in the context of liquefactive tissue necrosis. Uh, and that can be due to bacteria such as Staphylococcus. You can see that in acute appendicitis due to enteric bacteria. Now, one thing that we can see with pus is that we can get an abscess, which is a localized collection of pus deep in a tissue. And what we'll see grossly with an abscess will be that the central area is going to have this yellow, green, white necrotic material. Uh, this is pus. And the green white color is coming from the heme moiety that we see in myeloperoxidase, which is the enzyme used by uh, neutrophils to generate reactive oxygen species. And in an abscess, we'll have a thin wall. If it's uh, just an area of purulent inflammation, we won't see uh, this development. Microscopically, we're going to see uh, apoptotic and necrotic neutrophils, admixed with viable neutrophils, uh, and necrotic cellular debris. Now, if an abscess becomes chronic, which many of them do, uh, we can get chronic inflammation and repair with vasodilation and parenchymal fibroblastic uh, proliferation. So let's take a look first at just a regular uh, incidence of uh, purulent inflammation. Uh, this is a section of lung that has not been fixed in formalin from an individual with bronchopneumonia. And the arrows are showing all of these little areas of pus collection. And why is pus there? It's because neutrophils are going to uh, attack bacteria. So what we see microscopically, here we can see uh, residual lung. Uh, we can't really make this out very well. It's only because of your uh, incredible uh, observant uh, activity that you can recognize that these are the septa of the alveoli uh, with these congested um, uh, capillaries. So this is the vasodilation that we see in acute inflammation. Uh, and you can see here that we've lost that. So we've had uh, necrosis of this area, and it's filled here with uh, neutrophils. Uh, and, uh, and then we have some reactive uh, cells around that as well. So just whenever you see sheets of neutrophils, start thinking about uh, really a bacterial inflammation, uh, in, uh, infection. Now, this is an image uh, you'll see several times in my videos uh, because it's really nice. It covers a variety of uh, topics. So this is a splinter. You can recognize a little piece of wood here. This is the uh, overlying skin. And this is an abscess, uh, which has been in existence for quite a while. Uh, hence, we have this thick uh, fibrotic wall. Uh, so there's chronic inflammation. But what we see here is the abscess cavity. Let's look on higher magnification. Here is uh, the vegetable uh, cells of the splinter. And here is this necrotic uh, soup uh, of dead uh, neutrophils. And then uh, you can also appreciate here these epithelioid macrophages. And this is a granulomatous response to the splinter. Uh, but here we have the, uh, the abscess cavity. Now, one thing to keep in mind, I'm going to flip back to that earlier slide, uh, is that if uh, you were trying to just treat a patient like this with antibiotics, there's very little uh, oxygen here. There is very little blood flow. So you're not going to be able to treat this. Frequently, we'll do what's called an incision and drainage. So you'll make an incision here uh, and allow uh, this uh, pus to uh, come out uh, and, and therefore to heal. I suspect in this instance, because there was a piece of uh, wood here, they just found it easier to remove that entire uh, abscess cavity. This brings us to our last morphologic pattern, which is ulcers. So as I described, this is a local surface defect or excavation due to sloughing of inflamed necrotic tissue. And we can see this uh, in really three different situations. One will be the mucosa of the gastrointestinal tract, so the mouth, stomach, intestines, or in the genitourinary tract. We can also see it in the skin, and the classic presentation uh, will be when you have uh, vascular insufficiency. So this could be to diabetes, where you have peripheral vascular disease, uh, sickle cell anemia, or just outright peripheral vascular disease. 
Now, the third uh, pattern will be what we see with a decubitus ulcer or pressure sore. And you'll see this with patients who are debilitated, who are not able to move very well. And the uh, bony prominences will uh, push on the uh, soft tissue and cause ischemia. And over sufficient time, this can cause tissue breakdown and ulceration. This is why it's very important for our debilitated patients to move them frequently. Now, ulcers. Um, can have both acute and chronic uh, inflammation at the same time. And that's just another opportunity for me to remind you that although we talk about this as if it's acute inflammation, chronic inflammation, granulomatous inflammation, you can see all of it together. For example, in the case of that uh, splinter. With ulcers, uh, we can get this uh, in an acute ulcer. We get an intense neutrophilic infiltrate with peripheral vasodilation. And as it becomes chronic, we get fibroblast proliferation and scarring, and then mixed inflammation, so lymphocytes, plasma cells, and macrophages. One of the reasons we uh, continue to have this acute inflammation is because ulcers are, have an exposed area, which will continue to be seeded uh, with um, uh, bacteria and, and other uh, microbes. So here we have an example of a gastric ulcer. Uh, you can see it's sort of a punched out lesion in the stomach wall. Here is the histologic image. And again, you see we have this, this uh, loss of the uh, overlying uh, uh, mucosa. And here is the ulcer bed, which is clean as the gastric uh, acid is cleaning this away. Uh, but this is the uh, classic appearance uh, of an ulcer. Now, as I mentioned, we can also see this in peripheral vascular disease and in debilitated patients. Uh, this is an example of a diabetic ulcer. So individuals with diabetes have peripheral vascular disease due to increased atherosclerosis. Uh, and they also have a peripheral neuropathy. So uh, whereas um, uh, a patient who has not um, got a, a neuropathy would be aware of this lesion on the base of the foot, uh, someone with diabetes might not feel any pain at all. And so this can progress and become quite large. This is an example of a decubitus ulcer, which again shows us through this yellowish green exudate, uh, which is pus. So again, the yellowish green is from that heme moiety and myeloperoxidase. And then you can see the chronicity around it with this thickening uh, uh, and fibrosis of the surrounding skin. All right, this brings us as usual to uh, my uh, ending questions. Uh, and so basically the, the question would be to Think about what are the different morphologic patterns of acute inflammation and what are the clinical conditions associated with each of these. Uh, as always, thank you very much for your time. Follow me on Twitter. Comments down below are always appreciated. Thank you so much.